My name is Andres Martinez. I'm Vice President and Editorial Director here at the New America Foundation. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, before we get started, a housekeeping note. Uh, just be mindful that today's program is being uh, live cast on the web, so everything is obviously on the record. And uh, when we have questions and comment periods, uh, please wait for a microphone that will be circulating, and please uh, identify yourself. Today's event is uh, the latest in our uh, Future Tense series. Future Tense is a collaboration between New America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. Uh, today's compelling program uh, has a, an additional co-conspirator, I should say, um, and that is the 11th Hour Project and the Schmidt Family Foundation. And I want to acknowledge and thank Sarah Bell, who's a pro program manager um, with the 11th Hour Project. Thank you so much for uh, your support and leadership on this compelling issue. Um, the 11th Hour Project is doing a lot to build uh, capacity and to fund research on the compelling issue that brings us here today, which is how are we going to feed the world um, while the earth cooks? And uh, that's a somewhat provocative uh, way to put it, but I think it's a tale that can be told, the challenge that we face is a tale that can be told uh, by two books. Um, so I'm here to plug New America Fellow books. Uh, Getting Better by Charles Kenny, who's one of our Schwartz Fellows here at New America, and you'll be hearing from later on today, uh, wrote a fantastic book called Getting Better, which really chronicles many of the ways in which um, the last decade has been a tremendous success in raising living standards around the world um, and creating this uh, newly minted global middle class um, in much of the emerging world. And that's the good news. But as we all know, this is happening against the backdrop of a time when our planet and our resources are very constrained. And that is a tale um, that has been told probably more ably than any by anybody else by Mark Hertzgard, who is our Schmidt Family Foundation Fellow here in New America and will be our Master of Ceremonies for much of the day. Mark wrote, Hot, Living Through the Next 50 Years on Earth. So oftentimes when we think about this challenge of feeding the planet, you know, feeding our fellow humans, particularly at a time when their consumption rates are exploding as people become wealthier in, in some emerging markets and now clamor for the kind of lifestyles that we have, um, while at the same time continuing on with the struggle of feeding the world's neediest, how you accommodate that categorical, categorical imperative with the categorical imperative of being better stewards of our planet. Um, this is often, I think, thought of as a zero-sum game. And one of the issues that um, Sarah Bell and her team in, in San Francisco and many of the people we're going to be hearing about from today is trying to get a w get away from thinking about this as a conflict, that we have to choose one or the other. What technologies can, bring, can be brought to bear? What breakthroughs will it take so that we don't have to choose between feeding our fellow humans and taking better care of the planet? So that is why we're here today, and this, we have an exciting lineup of, of uh, thought leaders and researchers on these subjects. Um, and before we go any further, though, I just want to share a little anecdote about my childhood in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, back when I was, uh, <laughs> that was a little bit delayed. It's got to be louder than that. <laughs> Higher. So th this, is, this is a joke. I'm not going to burden you with a ch childhood anecdote. <laughs> but we're just, we're just tr trying out a new system of having, this is kind of like the Oscars when somebody goes on too long. We're going to put on music to cut, cut them off. Um, when we program these events, often we get very greedy because uh, we, we, there's so many people that we want to hear from and so many different perspectives that we want to bring to this platform. Um, so as you can see by looking at the program today, we're being very ambitious. We want to really have a robust uh, exchange of views and hear from many different perspectives. So we've really uh, been ambitious in programming and uh, there will be few breaks, although you're ob obviously welcome at any time to uh, stretch your legs, get out, um, grab coffee. Um, but we've really jam-packed the day and to keep things moving in an orderly fashion and trying to keep to the clock, uh, 
we will put on music uh, when it's time to segue. So apologies in advance to people that we cut off. And uh, I think we, the music needs to be a little bit louder, but we'll work on that. So without any further ado, I do want to introduce um, our thought leader on this subject at New America, Mark Hertzgard, who's going to kick us off and then uh, moderate uh, and be master of ceremonies for the rest of the day. Mark, as I mentioned, is our Schmidt Family Fellow Foundation here in New America and the author of HOT. So, Mark. Thank you, Andres. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming out for this. I think this is one of the most important questions facing humanity today. How are we going to feed ourselves in the 21st century? And it's something that I've been, uh, the issue of food is something I've been following since I was an undergraduate student at Johns Hopkins University uh, years ago. And I have followed it throughout my reporting career, um, including reporting from about 25 different countries around the world for uh, outlets ranging from the New Yorker and Vanity Fair and Time magazine to uh, NPR and the BBC and The Nation magazine, where I'm now the environment correspondent. And as I have looked at this and the years have gone by, it turns out that, as Andres foreshadowed, that climate is going to be a major challenge in this regard. And so I'm very happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to a great day of, of conversation and occasionally debate, I think. Let me tell you a little bit just to set the stage in terms of the uh, collision course that is described in your uh, schedule there uh, about the research that I did and the reporting that I did for HOT, the, the book that uh, Andres mentioned, which is uh, actually coming out in paperback this week. I remember seeing, I'm, I'm a father, and my daughter just turned seven last week. And so as I was reporting around the world, I invariably was drawn to the other little people who reminded me of her. And <clears throat> I've come to think of them, the young people in the world today, as generation hot. Because through no fault of their own, these children, and I would include there, this really shows my middle age, I suppose, everyone up to the age of 25, people who were born, I guess, what, 24 actually, uh, who were born after June of 1988, when the eminent NASA scientist James Hansen first came to the United States Congress and testified that, in his view, human activity was raising the temperatures on this planet. And to its great credit, the New York Times ran that story above the fold on the front page the following day, which in effect put it in every newsroom around the world. And as a reporter at that point, you could see the difference. Our editors, our producers were much more willing to hear that uh, story, that to do an environmental story. I heard that from colleagues overseas as well. And that was amplified when Time Magazine later that year chose in a quite unprecedented move uh, for its person of the year to name the endangered planet Earth as its person of the year. And there was a lot of attention internationally. Margaret Thatcher, some of you may recall, the first world leader who made a major speech saying on the international stage that we have to, to pay attention to climate change was Margaret Thatcher. I wish that some of the people in uh, the polarized debate in Washington, D.C. today could remember that was Margaret Thatcher, a scientist herself, who said, we have to pay attention to this. And crucially, let's not fight about how much it costs. Whatever it costs, we have to deal with it because we're talking about the basis of life on this planet. So we certainly had our warnings. <clears throat> and in 1990, the scientists of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued their first scientific report. And it looked like something was really going to happen. Uh, in 1992, there was the famous Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro that will be reprised in a couple of months in Rio at the Rio Plus 20 conference in June. But unfortunately, world leaders were not able to really make great progress there, although they did go on record at the Earth Summit in 1992 of saying that they would prevent dangerous, dangerous anthropogenic man-made 
uh, interference with the climate system. We now know, unfortunately, that that promise has proven hollow. The world has not acted quickly enough to prevent dangerous anthropogenic influence in our climate. And as a result, my daughter and the other two billion young people born on this planet since Jim Hansen's testimony in June 1988 are now fated to spend the rest of their lives coping with the hottest and most volatile climate that humans have ever faced since we started practicing agriculture 10,000 years ago. So that is the challenge that we're now facing. How do we manage in the face of that kind of, of uh, heat and extreme weather? We have changed the weather on this planet. And over the next 50 years, climate change is going to transform almost everything we do, from how we deploy our militaries to how we write insurance to how we talk to our children about the future, and above all, how we grow food. I'm going to give just a couple of quick examples before I introduce our first two panelists that um, may help put this into uh, perspective for those of you who, like me, are not scientists. But I have, as a journalist, the privilege of interviewing a lot of eminent scientists and trying to share their views with the rest of us. I was very struck by the example of corn, which, as you may know, is the major crop grown in the United States by volume. It is inside of virtually not every product that you see on your grocery shelves, but well over half. My brilliant colleague, Michael Pollan, has uh, written about how corn is the basis for so much of the modern American diet. And it's also important uh, in many other countries, obviously. But it does not reproduce when it is exposed to extended periods of 95 degree Fahrenheit heat. It won't germinate. Now, in the past, that was not a terrible problem. In Iowa, for example, Iowa experienced three straight days of 95 degree temperatures only once a decade throughout the 20th century once a decade. But by 2040, that's less than 30 years from now, my daughter will be my age by then. She might be having kids herself by then. By 2040, if we stay on our current greenhouse gas emissions path, Iowa will be experiencing 95 days Fahrenheit for more than three days at a stretch, those kinds of heat waves, not one year out of 10, but three years out of four three years out of four. At the same time, we're going to have an increase in global food demand. As Andres mentioned, our current population is about 7 billion on this planet. The UN projects, the mean projection is about 9.3 billion by 2050. That's 2 billion more people. And at the same time, as the rise in, in middle income, global middle income people increases, they will be wanting diets that are more varied, more ample, and therefore will be requiring more resources. And anyone, and I'm sure there's many in this room like myself, who have spent a lot of time in countries uh, in other parts of the world, whether it be China, where you really see this quite dramatically, uh, or other parts of Asia, or Latin America, or Africa, who with any heart could say to those people, no, no, you, you can't have that. The earth can't manage that, especially after we have had it for so long and enjoy it so bountifully. So is this a collision course, this kind of rising demand and the constraints that the weather will be putting on us? That's what we're here to discuss today. And <clears throat> the goal that I hear from all the experts and the scientists of what we need to be doing on all fields, not just food, as we confront climate change over the next 50 years, we have to have a two-pronged imperative. And they call it avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable, by which they mean we must avoid an unmanageable amount of global warming and climate change, even as we manage what the amount of global warming and climate change that is already unavoidable. 
I'll talk quickly about the second because that is often lost, especially still here in the United States where our uh, public discussion of climate change is so much behind the rest of the world because there is a large segment of the political economy, uh, especially in this city, that still refuses to believe in climate science. As a result, there is not the kind of appreciation that there should be that this is a moving train and that there is a lag effect. The simple laws of physics and chemistry mean that even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions tonight on this planet, which of course is impossible because it would mean shutting hospitals and food supplies and so forth, but even if we did that, the inertia, the sheer physical inertia of the Earth's climate system would mean that the temperatures would still continue to go up for another 30, 40 years. So we are already locked into a significant amount of climate change, and we have got to manage that. <clears throat> we are going to be seeing, at a conservative level, at least three feet of sea level rise on this planet, whether it will be in 100 years, 150 years, or worst case scenarios, some scientists are now saying in 50 years we could see three feet of sea level rise. We have got to prepare for that, and that will have an enormous potential impact on food production. Just consider the fact that some of the richest agricultural land on this earth are in the Delta regions, whether it be the Nile or the Ganges in, in uh, East Asia uh, or here in the United States. How are we going to protect them from three feet of sea level rise? There's a lot of people working on that. We can talk about it um, in the course of the day. But it's one of the things that we have to prepare for. But let's make sure, going back to the front part of avoid the unmanageable, let's make sure it's not 10 feet of sea level rise that we have to cope with. So we have got to both reduce the amount of greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere, even as we, to avoid the unmanageable, to avoid that 10 feet, to avoid three summers out of four in Iowa being too hot to grow corn, and at the same time, we have to manage the unavoidable. And I'll close with a, <clears throat> I think, the single most hopeful story that I came across while researching HOT. And it's something that uh, may seem odd at first because it's actually located in Africa, which is certainly uh, a place that has suffered a lot because of food, but it is also a place that can teach us a lot. We tend to think of, oh, we're the ones that have to help the Africans feed themselves. Well. <clears throat> As Sarah Shear, who was a, a, a very valuable source of mine when I was writing HOT, pointed out, um, much of the world is going to be encountering the kinds of weather that Africans are already facing today. And therefore, we can look at how they have been adapting to this. They have not intended to adapt to climate change. Most of the farmers that I interviewed in Western Africa, they didn't, they're illiterate. They don't even know the term climate change. But they are adapting to it nonetheless. And how are they doing that? They are growing trees. They're growing trees amid their fields of millet and sorghum. Now, the average Iowa farmer would, would scoff at that because you can't drive a tractor through it. But in Africa, it has turned out to be brilliantly effective. Because when you grow trees, you have many co-benefits, including the fact that you lower the temperatures in the field through the shade, you, above all, increase the water retentiveness of the soil because as the roots go down into the soil, they aerate it, and they therefore allow the soil, when you do get those rare bouts of rainfall, that the rain soaks in to the soil rather than flashing off. And so we have seen, and I must say, I, I'm not sure I would have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, that uh, in Vast areas of Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, that area of the Western Sahel, doubling and tripling of crop yields, granted from a very low base, but doubling and tripling of crop yields and underground water tables recharging some as much as 15 meters in the course of, of a decade. And the most heartening aspect of that is watching little kids my daughter's age and seeing that the malnutrition rate in those villages is shrinking. And this transformation in the Sahel is so pervasive you can literally see it from outer space. 
because of the satellite pictures of the U.S. Geological Survey. It has spread that widely. You can see the border between Niger, where it is practiced, and Nigeria, where it is de facto outlawed. So there are things that we can do. And we're going to talk in a second about uh, the role of genetically modified seeds. But I think it is important for us to perhaps widen our minds a little bit about where solutions can come from. It's not all out of the laboratories as important as they are. It has to do with respecting not just the people in those places, but respecting the ecological laws that make agriculture possible in the first place. And if we do that, I think that uh, my daughter and the other children in Generation Hot have a fighting chance at inheriting a livable planet. I really do think, and Sarah Shear will talk about this in a moment, agriculture turns out to be one of the few tricks that we have up our sleeve as we face this imperative of avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. Agriculture is the one sector where we know through photosynthesis that we can actually extract carbon out of the atmosphere.